All right, everybody, welcome back to another video. Today, we're doing number two in our series of Pilsner videos. This one is gonna be all about Czech Pils slash Bohemian Pilsner. Hey, if it's your first time here, I just want to welcome you to the channel and say thanks for stopping by and checking this out. On this channel, I typically make grain to glass videos like this one you're watching right now, but I also do shorter, more informative videos as well, talking about other educational concepts and stuff like that. If you like either of those things, please go ahead, hit that subscribe button, and check out my channel page for additional content. Also, for context on this video, I definitely highly recommend going back and watching the first video in the series, the German Pilsner uh, video, which is gonna be linked up here in the corner. That kind of goes over a lot of the basics about what exactly I'm doing here with this Pilsner series, and it also has a lot of the same information for the style that we're working on today, the Czech Pilsner. Uh, but really quickly, I'm just going to go over a couple differences here between the German Pilsner and the Czech Pilsner. Uh, the German Pilsner, which we did last week, that's a, a hoppy, bitter beer, right? Very dry, nice and sessionable, very light colored, very highly carbonated, relatively easy beer to brew. And now today we're going to talk about the Czech Pilsner, which is actually a little bit different. When people think about Pilsners, they really usually are thinking about German Pilsners uh, instead of Czech Pilsners. Czech Pilsners are actually very, very different. The Czech Pilsner is, after all, the original Pilsner. It is the first version of the pale lager that Josef Grohl uh, brewed when he went to the Bohemian region and started brewing in the town of Pilsen. The Czech Pilsner that we're working on today is going to be sweeter. It's going to be much, much maltier. Uh, it's going to have a little bit more complexity to it. It's also not going to have as sharp and bitter of a hot profile as the German Pilsner did. So the reason for that is primarily water, but it's also due to our mashing technique. We're gonna do a different mashing technique than usual here. Uh, the water that we use for a Czech Pilsner is typically going to be extremely soft with almost no minerality in it, and we're sticking to that today. Whereas the German Pilsner had a little bit more minerality in it and it had higher sulfate levels. Now today we're gonna to take a nod to tradition and we're gonna decoction mash. Uh, we're gonna do a single decoction, not a triple decoction. This is gonna give the beer a lot of additional complexities and uh, flavors. It's also something I haven't done in a while and um, occasionally it's pretty fun to do. And uh, also, if you don't want to decoction mash this beer, which is totally understandable, it's a lot of work, uh, then I would go ahead and add in about half a pound of melanoidin malt to the grist and then do a regular uh, single infusion mash at the same temperature that I'll be doing most of my mashing at during this recipe. There's a lot of debate out there about the effectiveness and uh, the results of decoction mashing, and I've had different results depending on what kinds of beers I've worked on. I've done a single decoction in a Maybach that made a tremendous difference, and I've done a double decoction in a Hefeweizen that made a little difference. Um, however, for the most part, a single decoction is probably just fine for this. What we're going to get out of that is a darker beer, which is actually characteristic, as well as a little residual sweetness and um, hopefully a little bit of extra Maillard reaction going out, a little extra caramelization of things uh, to create a little extra malt flavor. German Pilsner, in contrast, was step mashed, and it was step mashed for attenuation so that we would get a nice dry beer, which we did. The Czech Pils, on the other hand, it's not going to be nearly as dry as the German Pils, and that makes for a very different beer. Even though we're using a very similar grist to the German Pilsner, this beer should be a lot fuller and maltier um, and complex. That's actually kind of hard to do with a single grain and the grist, so you kind of have to do the decoction to get a little bit extra flavor. And because that recipe is so simple and because the Pilsner flavor is so delicate, hopefully we will end up seeing a little bit more uh, of that decoction character in the final beer. I'm really excited to see how that turns out. Also, because of that decoction mash, I need an extra heat source, so we're going to be brewing inside today and doing the decoction mash on my stove. Alright, so without further ado, let's get into the recipe here. So we're going to be starting off with a very special malt here. This is Weyermann 4 Malted Bohemian Pilsner Malt. Uh, what that means essentially is that this malt has been malted in the traditional way, not the more modern ways, which results in it being slightly under-modified. What that means basically is there's less diastatic power, there's less enzyme capability in this malt um, to convert itself in other malts. And what that means is we have to do a little bit extra work during the mash 
to actually make it uh, unlock the full potential of its starches. Something like a decoction mash or a step mash is what you do with an undermodified malt to make something like that work. It also has the side benefit of having a more complex flavor than traditional regularly malted Pilsner malt. Um, and I think that's going to be a very interesting thing to see how that impacts everything. And then that's pretty much it, but we're also going to add four ounces of acidulated malt because we have such a soft water profile, we have such a pale grist, uh, we need to make sure that we keep the uh, pH of the mash in check. So hopefully four ounces is enough acid malt to actually make that work. Um, if not, we will correct with lactic acid, but regardless, if you're brewing with this grist and with this water profile that I'm about to show you, then you will absolutely need to do some sort of pH correction with an acid in the mash to make sure that your mash pH is not way too high. For hops, uh, even though this is not a German Pilsner and it's not as bright and zippy and, you know, sharp hop flavor um, as German Pilsner, it still has a lot of hops in it. They're all saws too, so we're working with 3% alpha acid saws. And uh, Sans is a little bit different of a hop than the Hallertau and the Tetnang that I used in the last brew. So it'll be really interesting to kind of compare the two brews side by side to see what the noble hop differences are. So one thing we're going to start out with though that's a little bit different than the last brew is a first wort hop. We're going to do two ounces of Saz at a first wort hop. And what that means is right after the mash is completed and we're sitting at mash out temperatures, we chuck in those hops. So those hops actually stay in the wort the entire time that it's heating up to a boil and then all the way through the boil as well. Um, and that results in a little bit different of an extraction uh, of bitterness. For some sort of unknown reason, uh, supposedly first wort hopping is a little bit less aggressive of a bitterness than a straight up 60 minute bittering addition. As for me, also like decoction mashing, I've had varying results. Um, sometimes it has been a little extra bitter and sometimes it has been a little more nuanced and smooth. Um, and I think that has a lot to do probably with the type of hop that you're using as well uh, and the types of hop oils that we're working with here. Many Czech or Bohemian Pilsner recipes out there really actually do recommend first word hopping um, a lot of the time. So I think I'm going to go ahead and do it. Then we're not going to do anything for a 90 minute boil until 10 minutes from the end where we will toss in another two ounces of saws. And then lastly to top it off, we'll toss in two more ounces of saws at zero minutes. So pretty heavy on the late boil on this one because we don't necessarily want a ton of bitterness like we did with the German pills. We want a little bit more of that flavor, a little bit more of that aroma, especially with saws, which is pretty cool. For yeast on this brew, we're gonna be using pretty much a classic strain for the Czech Pilsner. This is Imperial L28 Urkel yeast, which is, well, unsurprisingly, this is the Pilsner Urkel strain. Pilsner Urkel is Pilsner Original. That's the original Pilsner that was made in Pilsen, pretty much unchanged ever since the 1840s, which is pretty cool. Uh, and it's a nice beer. So I figured we would use their yeast. So this water profile is actually a little bit more minerally than most Czech Pilsner water profiles are. And the reason why is because I just, I need to have a little bit of calcium in there because otherwise we could have some serious issues with mash efficiency. So I just want to make sure that we are actually on track with that. Um, so the water profile I'm using is 12 parts per million of calcium, three parts per million of magnesium, nine parts per million of sodium, 21 parts per million of chloride, 13 parts per million of sulfate, and uh, 23 parts per million of bicarbonate. And in order to get that water profile, all I'm adding is one gram each of Epsom, calcium chloride, and baking soda. That's it. Even though I did add a few salts to the whole thing, it really is not a very minerally water profile, and it is among the lightest, softest water profiles that I've ever used in a beer, so it should be very interesting to see how that works. For the mash on this one, like I said, this is a single decoction. Czech Pilsners traditionally were made with undermodified Pilsner malt in a triple decoction mash, which is crazy. Um, and I just don't have the time or patience to do that right now. Yes, sometime in the future, I probably will do something like that. that that's not this day. Um, we're gonna go ahead and just do a single decoction on that, which that basically gets us 90% of that effect of the decoction mash uh, with about 30% of the work. So uh, hopefully it's not too bad. And the way this is gonna work is I'm gonna hold a 154 degree Fahrenheit single infusion rest for 90 minutes. Because of that undermodified malt, it's gonna require a lot longer to convert all of the starches into sugars. Now, 45 minutes into that rest, I am going to pull out about nine quarts of thick mash for decoction. And then we will heat that up to boiling temperatures on the stove, and we will boil our decoction for about 30 or 45 minutes. 
And then at that point, I'll add it all back into the main mash. That raises everything up to the mash out temperature. It may seem counterintuitive actually boiling the mash because you might think that you're uh, actually killing off the enzymes, but in fact, most of the enzymes in the mash actually remain in the liquid in the main mash. So, but basically by doing this process with the decoction and by boiling it and, and applying that intense heat, you are creating caramelizations and Maillard reactions within the decoction, which then make their way back into the beer to add a little bit of additional flavor and a lot of complexity. It also darkens your beer a little bit. Also, the act of doing this in the mash adds other compounds which shelf stabilize your beer for a long time, and it also helps clarify your work quite significantly, which is a pretty cool side effect. If you've never done it before, I highly recommend doing it at least once, uh, so you can understand exactly how it works and see what you think about the whole process. I like the cocktail mashing simply because it is actually a really cool way to uh, put literal time, effort, and work into your beer, um, and it kind of all makes it taste a little bit better at the end of the day anyway. But enough rambling about that, everything is all set up now. Uh, like I said, I'm in the kitchen, so we're gonna go over there, we're gonna dough in, and uh, start this mash. Once the strike water in my claw hammer supply 120 volt system reached my mash in temperature, I mashed in with the grain bill, being sure to break up any clumps in the mash. Next, I started recirculating. I let the mash sit for about 10 minutes recirculating and then I took a pH measurement and I saw a measurement of 5.67 which was still far too high despite my addition of acidulated malt. So to correct this I added about 3 milliliters of lactic acid and this brought the mash pH back down to where it should be around 5.3. I let the mash sit at 152 Fahrenheit for 45 minutes, and then I began to decoct thick mash. You want to make sure you're getting mostly grain and a little bit of liquid when you're doing this. I decocted 9 quarts of thick mash, and then I heated it up to boiling on the stove over medium-high heat. Stirring constantly and being sure to scrape the bottom of the pot to get all the grain off of it and prevent scorching. I kept this up for a full 45 minutes. Don't ever walk away from your decoction because the grain will scorch on you, and you don't want that. So you have to really watch over it the entire 45 minutes or so. It does help to put on an episode of your favorite TV show or listen to some music or something to pass the time, and I highly recommend doing that. Once the decoction was complete, you could see noticeable darkening of the grain. You could also smell rich graininess and caramel kind of smells and almost a chocolate note as well. It really does smell pretty amazing. I added the decoction back into the main mash only a few quarts at a time, being sure to stir and fully incorporate it as to not overshoot my temperature. I also set the temperature on the element to the mash out temp even though no additional heat was actually needed. Uh, after reaching the mash out temperature I let it stay there for about 15 minutes and then I pulled out the grain basket and I let that drain for another 15 minutes. However, as soon as I did that I fired up the controller to 100% power to get a jump start on the boil. I pulled a sample of work for the pre-boil gravity reading and I saw a measurement of 10.5 bricks or 1041 which was eh, 3 points lower than the target pre-boil gravity but not too bad. As soon as I removed the grain basket I added my first wort hops which was 2 ounces of size. Once I reached the boil, I let the boil continue for another 80 minutes. At that point I added my 10 minute hop addition, another 2 ounces of size, a whirlflock tablet, and some yeast nutrient. Lastly, I started recirculating boiling wort through my chiller to sanitize it, and this is the easiest way to ensure sanitation of your chilling equipment. Once the boil ended, I added my zero minute hop addition, two more ounces of saws, and I began chilling. I let the wort chill to about 70 Fahrenheit, and I aerated the wort with pure O2 uh, with a dose of about one minute at full blast. At this point, I pitched the yeast.
I took an OG sample and I recorded an original gravity of about 12 bricks or 1047, which was about five points short of my target OG, but still plenty sufficient for this beer. Lastly, ensuring I had a proper pressure relief valve installed, I applied about 15 PSI of pressure to the fermenter and then I let it sit and left it to ferment. All right, so now it's time to talk about fermentation on this one. Uh, with the German Pilsner, I did a classic lager fermentation where I took it, I fermented it at 50 degrees for uh, about a week or so, ramped it up to room temperature for a diacetyl rest, and then kegged it and let it sit in the keg and do a traditional lagering phase for two or three weeks to crisp up and clarify. Well, for this beer, we're gonna take things on a slightly different approach. Uh, part of the goal of this series on Pilsners is to kind of explore some of the additional things you can do to uh, make lagers in various different ways. And one of the ways that we could do that is through pressure fermentation. So I have yet to use my Spike CF5 as a uh, pressure fermenter, so we're gonna go ahead and do that today. Relax and don't worry if you don't have a stainless steel conical fermenter. You can also do this with the Firmzilla All-Rounder, which is a about $50 fermenter, which will hold a great amount of pressure and do exactly the same thing, just made out of plastic. Um, I have one, I've used it many times. It's a great fermenter. Pressure fermentation means we're gonna go ahead and ferment this at room temperature. However, I'm gonna add like 10 to 15 PSI of additional pressure in the fermenter. What this does is suppress the uh, creation of fusel alcohols and off flavors from fermenting a yeast warmer than its intended temperature. But it doesn't just suppress the bad flavors that would potentially be created by fermenting too warm, it also suppresses all of the esters and other kind of yeast characteristics that you get uh, from traditional fermentation. So this is not a technique that I would ever recommend using with an ale yeast if you want to get any sort of yeast character and into your beer. But with a lager, where we're looking for just clean, uh, neutral flavor from the yeast, then it's a really good method. Um, not only does it make your fermentation super fast, but it makes it super clean, so it's kind of a win-win. Obviously, you don't need to pressure ferment the beer. Uh, if you want to go down the traditional lager route, that is absolutely fine as well. Or you can switch up your yeast to W3470 and ferment it slightly lower than room temperature, probably about 65 degrees, um, and you'll end up with a very clean beer that's a little bit easier to do if you don't happen to have temperature control. Um, I've used 3470 yeast many, many times at a variety of temperatures from 50 degrees all the way up to about 70. Uh, and it is indeed a very, very clean yeast, even up at those temperatures. Um, so I definitely recommend going that way if you don't happen to have uh, solid temperature control or pressure fermentation uh, abilities. So typically with a lager, you need two to five weeks of cold storage uh, to be able to drop the yeast out of the beer and clarify it. This also creates the effect of making it feel crispy. Well, there is a little bit of a hack here which can save you several weeks on the lagering process, and that is simply just adding some sort of findings to your finished beer. Uh, so post-fermentation findings. Typically, I will use gelatin finings, uh, which basically strip the yeast out of the beer and uh, let it sink to the bottom, which usually in three to five days will create an absolutely bright beer. However, gelatin doesn't always pull everything out. It usually just pulls yeast out. So if you happen to have other things floating around in your beer, like hot polyphenols or proteins, you might wanna look into a different finding agent or a two-stage finding agent, because the way the finding agent works is it's a charged particle, usually a negatively charged particle, and that basically attracts positively charged particles, which are yeast, floating around in your beer. And the two charges attract and they sink to the bottom and it pulls stuff out of your beer. However, if there's a negatively charged haze creating particle in your beer, then it's not going to do anything to it, it's just gonna repel it. So you might wanna look into a two-stage finding agent. Two-stage finding agents have one negatively charged dose and one positively charged dose, which gets everything out of your beer. Now, that being said, I haven't really used them because I find gelatin to be sufficient nine times out of 10, uh, and I'm okay having a little haze in a beer sometimes. So in a nutshell, what we're doing is fermenting this at a uh, room temperature, basically 68 uh, to 72 degrees, for probably about five to seven days, under about 10 to 15 PSI of pressure. At this point, the beer should be finished. We'll transfer it into a keg. We'll let it condition for another week or two just to make sure we got rid of all the diacetyl if there is any. And then we'll get it into the keg, we'll get it cold, we'll add gelatin findings to it to help clarify. So hopefully this all works out pretty well and I'll catch you guys in a few weeks. Obviously, we're still a little bit hazy, uh, but the diacetyl rest is complete and our final gravity is parked at about 1012. Uh, which is great. So we ended up with uh, pretty much an on-target beer here. 
So fermentation for the Czech pills went really uh, very quickly without a hitch. So I went ahead, I attached a spunning valve to my fermenter and I pressurized it to about 15 PSI. Uh, and basically then the spunning valve held about 15 PSI in the fermenter as the yeast fermented and generated additional uh, CO2 pressure in the fermenter. It just kept it steady at about 15. I also let it just free rise naturally to room temperature um, and ferment at room temperature, which at this time of year for me is about 72 degrees. As soon as the yeast had finished their primary fermentation, the amount of uh, excess CO2 they were creating and the pressure that they were creating started to kind of dwindle down and the pressure in the fermenter naturally fell. So towards the end of the fermentation, we were looking at a very low pressure inside the fermenter at one or two PSI. Eventually it actually dwindled all the way down to zero. Uh, overall fermentation only took about a week. Uh, at that point, the beer was tasting phenomenal and it was time to keg it. At that point, I cold crashed and I kegged the beer and I added gelatin uh, as soon as the beer was cold enough and basically then let it sit on gas carbonating up over the course of the last week. It's been in the keg for about a week and the beer is about two weeks old at this point. It is tasting mighty good and uh, has dropped out quite clear during this time. This beer is without a doubt one of my best lagers I have done in a very long time and I'm really very excited to share it with you and talk with you guys about it. So let's go ahead and pour it. Okay, so the beer is called Rhapsody in Gold and it comes in at 4.6% ABV and 32 IBUs. So for the appearance of the beer, it pours completely clear. It's completely bright after one week of keg conditioning with gelatin and uh, has a beautiful gold coloring to it. Um, it is extremely hot and humid out today, so there's a lot of condensation on the glass. It also pours with a small white head uh, that disappears quickly but leaves a good layer on the surface. Um, I did not actually carbonate this beer to a very high level uh, because it really does kind of help accentuate the special delicate multi flavor of this style. Uh, the German pills you want to carbonate higher, but the Czech pills you actually want to kind of keep the carbonation at a lower level. It really does kind of help bring out a lot of those intricate malt flavors. This is also a great opportunity for me to use some of my favorite glassware. Uh, I just, there's something about Pilsner glasses. I love them. Um, I'm not sure why, but they're a lot of fun. All right, so now let's go in for aroma. So this actually is a really nice, rich aroma to it. I get a lot of malt out of this, uh, so you get your Pils malt aroma, which is typically like that kind of crackery, hay-like character, but is also something that was not in the German Pils, but is in this one. And that's kind of just like this really nice biscuit note. Um, there's a little bit more deeper, richer kind of malt character in here along the lines of biscuit or toast. There's also a, a sweet honey kind of character that's coming out of this as well. You get a decent amount of like spice as well from the saws hops. Um, overall, very, very different character already from the German pills. Right, next, we're going to talk about mouthfeel. This has a really unique mouthfeel that I've kind of come to love over the last week or so that this has been on tap. Um, it's really very soft. It's extremely delicate. Um, the mouthfeel is nothing like the German pills. It's actually nothing like most of the other lagers that I've made um, because there's very little minerality to it. It's soft and it's almost fluffy. It's almost like a rice lager's fluffiness, um, but it's just extremely delicate, very, very light bodied, but without being watery. It doesn't have any sort of fullness or like, you know, weedy like puffiness, but it's very soft. There's no sharp edges. It really suits this quite well and it makes me understand why the Pilsner became such a popular style so fast. Another thing to mention here is that I did keep the carbonation on this quite low. Um, not so low as like a British ale, but low enough, lower than your typical Pilsner style. Significantly lower than the German Pilsner uh, because it does really help bring out those flavor nuances. Uh, and it actually makes for a very, very interesting flavor experience. So now we're gonna go in for flavor. Oh, man. <laughs> like I said, this is honestly one of the best lagers that I've ever made out of all of the lagers that I've made. It's honestly the best Pilsner I've ever made, hands down. It has a tremendous depth of flavor and complexity without becoming something that it's not. 
but honestly, the sheer amount of different types of flavors that you get from this beer uh, is immense, but still somehow the ways in which they all manifest themselves is very delicate. No single flavor is really too strong or too dominant in this beer. Uh, they really all just sing and harmonize together in a really beautiful way. Uh, and it's just amazing that that can happen from such a simple recipe. Uh, so let's just kind of break down what I'm getting out of this, right? First of all, there is a nice sulfur tang to this. Um, what is absent in most beers that I brew, at least most lagers, is a sulfur note. Uh, in most cases, that sort of thing ages out a little bit, but I think the pressure fermentation actually increased the amount of sulfur uh, that we would get due to the actual stressing of the yeast uh, due to the external pressure. But what happened is this slight sulfur note here uh, is actually really accentuating the overall flavor uh, in a really, really nice way. That's something you get in a lot of professional lagers, and it's definitely something you don't really get that often out of W3470 dry yeast, which I use in most lagers. Um, the Urkel yeast, I think, kicked off a little extra sulfur, and obviously the pressure fermentation as well had an impact on that. It's just a really nice flavor to complement everything else. Next, there's just that beautiful malt character. Um, rich breadiness. Uh, but like a white bread, so it's not, you know, as intensive a breadiness as, as other German lagers, like a, like a Dunkel, for example, that's a very, very bready lager. Um, but this has that kind of toasty, nutty, um, light bread character, but it's got this richness that's different, um, especially different from the German Pilsner. Uh, it just has so much more character, it's so much more depth. It's probably a combination of the fact that I use the Bohemian Pilsner malt, which is definitely a lot more uh, flavor heavy than regular German Pils uh, malt, but also the decoction mash added a decent amount of melanoidins and Maillard reaction character, which makes it deeper and richer in flavor. Uh, so I think the combination of those two things made for this particularly awesome uh, flavor characteristic that I'm getting out of this. So you get that really nice character I just described, but on top of that, you're getting toastiness, you're getting nuttiness um, and like a really cool biscuity like just deep breadiness um, that is just really good and the icing on top the bow on the package is the sauce hops which are just coming through in a really wonderful uh, floral way I get more floral than herbal character uh, at least in this particular example sauce really does have its own special unique a uh, combination of the floral, herbal, spicy, noble hop character. Um, really way, way, way better than the uh, the flavor that I was getting out of the German pills. Um, just so much cleaner and, and spicier, and it's just got almost like a lavender character to it that is so welcome in this. So just for kicks, I decided I'd pour myself some of the German pills as well. I really enjoyed making both of these, but every single time, if you put both of these in front of me, I am going to choose the Czech Pilsner um, because it is just a whole lot more. Now that is not necessarily reflective of the German Pils style versus the Czech Pils style. That is reflective of my interpretations of each style and how I brewed them. I definitely chose two very different brewing methods for each of these beers. I brewed this one about two weeks after I brewed this one and they were both ready at about the same time, even though the German Pils is still kind of in its Keller Pils state. The overall impression of getting out of this is really that a pressure fermented gelatin fined lager can definitely hold its own and stand up to a lager that was made the old school way. And neither method is necessarily better than the other. I don't think one is going to make a, you know, exceptionally better beer than the other. It just goes to show that there are new methods and new procedures that are evolving nowadays that mean that you don't necessarily need to take as much time to create your beer as you used to in the past. There is one thing about pressure fermentation I do need to make known though, and that is just please be sure to do it safely. It is dangerous uh, when you put 10 and 15 PSI inside of any container, and if it ruptures, that's a very dangerous situation uh, regardless of the material. So just make sure that whatever you're using to pressure ferment with can actually withstand the uh, intense pressures that are involved. Vessels I would recommend for that would be like a corny keg that can withstand over 100 PSI. Um, any unit tank uh, that is rated for 15 or 30 PSI. So like the Spike Flex, the Spike CF series, the uh, SS Brutec unit tanks. Also Brew Tools makes a series of unit tanks as well. And if you want to go on the cheaper end, I would recommend the Firmzilla All Rounder, uh, which is another fantastic fermenter. 
The other thing that I would advise against doing if you're pressure fermenting is reusing the yeast. Um, it does undergo a decent amount of stress during the fermentation due to the external pressure. And it basically ensures that you're probably gonna have some issues if you reuse your yeast for a second batch. I have not tried it, so I can't necessarily say whether or not that is true, but science does kind of seem to imply that it is. Normally I do a potential improvement section towards the end of the video, just to kind of highlight anything I would do differently uh, that if I were to brew the beer again. And this one is really hard to pick up on something with because it is ultimately uh, one of the best beers, if not the best beer that I have brewed so far this year and in a long time. I really surprised myself, at least in this one, as to uh, how good this beer turned out. Um, and I would not really change anything at all. And overall, I really wouldn't change a single detail about how I made this beer uh, to include the pressure fermentation, to include the gelatin findings. Uh, it really worked out wonderfully, um, and I would be hesitant to make any sort of modification to this. Me being a hophead, I suppose the only thing I would have uh, done differently to kind of make this into something else would be to maybe add a little bit more aroma hops. Uh, so that would involve either a uh, increased zero minute addition, or even if you're feeling adventurous, maybe a dry hop because um, that could actually get pretty cool. Anyway, guys, I really hope you enjoyed this video. You learned from it. You found something useful. And if you did, just do me a favor. Hit that like button and subscribe if you're not subscribed already for more content like this. If you want to support the channel, please go check out the merch store that's in the description box down below. You can get this awesome t-shirt as well as many other selections and different types of items, pint glasses, hoodies, ball caps, t-shirts, tank tops, you name it. It's all down below the description box in my Teespring store. Please check that stuff out if you want to support the channel. There's also links in the description box as well for various types of homebrewing gear that I recommend uh, wholeheartedly. And also, if you want to support the channel on a more personal level, please check out the Patreon, which is also linked in the description box down below. If you're interested in following me on other types of social media besides YouTube, I'm active pretty much only on Instagram as The Apartment Brewer. Uh, so check that out for more frequent uh, content updates and kind of a behind the scenes idea of what's gonna be happening next on the channel. I really do hope you guys enjoyed this and thank you for sticking around and watching to the end. So if you made it this far, you guys are my true fans and you guys matter the most and I appreciate you. So thank you so much for watching and I will catch you guys in the next one. So until then, cheers.